get into um, what I call the meat of the discussions, taking this discussion directly to the to the seats of the policymakers as we continue in this conversation. And you have heard the voice of Nkechi, but now you are going to hear a live voice of <laughs> Nkechi Olaliri. Once again, Nkechi is the executive director for Spark. Um, so I'd like to welcome her to take on this um, conversation. Welcome, Nkechi. Thank you so much, Dari. And it is really exciting to be here um, and to have this conversation with everyone here. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Cheryl, for the great intro um, to this conversation. I'm really looking forward to taking that further. So our discussion today is going to be with a panel, a panel of policymakers who are going to tell us a bit more about how they're practicing, utilizing the strategic purchasing concepts in their different countries. But before then, perhaps a little intro. Um, the poets, a tough act to follow, I absolutely agree, have sort of laid the groundwork for the conversation we wanna have. Over the past two decades, we've actually seen that there has been an increase in financial commitments by governments to help um, in low and middle income countries. However, more money for health does not necessarily translate to better outcomes, especially if they're not spent efficiently. And that's where strategic health purchasing comes in. That's efficient use of limited resources to ensure that we get the best health outcomes for the population. And so it really involves all of those decisions that we talked about, what to buy, who to buy from, and how to pay. Um, really making sure that we're getting the best quality services, especially for priority populations like the poor and the vulnerable. Again, as the poets have said, because you're talking about prioritizing, essentially these decisions could mean life and death for the people who are involved. And that's really everybody because we're all affected by these decisions. The trade-offs are also not easy. When you think about the increasing demand, the increasing need for primary health care, and you know, that competing with the fact that a lot of governments are really excited by and focused on very expensive tertiary care. And then you also think about the fact that, yes, while we do have increasing financial commitments to health, even in the midst, um, even in the midst of the fact that we know that it's still not enough. Um, if we use the Abuja declaration, not too many countries have actually met that 15%, but then you have that increase in uh, funding competing with people also demanding an expanded benefits package. So it's a very tough one for policymakers to navigate and then add to the mix COVID-19, which has further contracted an already small fiscal space. That's why for us, strategic purchasing is not just an option, it's not just a choice. It's almost like um, something that has to be done. It has to be done and it has to be done now. At Spark, this is our reason that This is the reason why we wake up every morning and we go to work, supporting countries to make those key decisions using very limited resources. And, at Spark, we're also focused on how this approach is provided. It's the soft skills needed to navigate those political economies that we talked about. And so at Spark, we're as much about our technical mandate as we are about the real, uh, about the way that we provide the support. And so today to discuss this, what has happened two years since the last Africa Health Agenda International Conference, two years since the launch of Spark, what has changed in the strategic purchasing ecosystem? And to do justice to this conversation, I have very four distinguished um, policymakers to discuss this with me. First, I have Nat Otu. Nat is a senior fellow at R4D, and he was also the pioneer executive director for Spark and former CEO for Ghana National Health Insurance Agency. Nat is a health systems and policy, public policy consultant with over 11 years of work experience in health insurance implementation. He has contributed to and supported numerous global, regional, and local UHC activities and events. 
as a founding father, uh, founding member of the JLM and later its first convener, uh, Nathaniel has supported JLM and he's also a member of Duke uh, University Launch and Scale Speedometer Advisory Board and also serves on several other boards. Please join me to welcome um, Nat. You're welcome, Nat. Moving very quickly to the very next um, panelist, I have Dr. Pafe Owalirai. And having uh, pronounced the surname uh, for the first time, I shall not be repeating it again for fear of murdering it. And so uh, you're welcome, Deji Pafe. Deji Pafe is the head of planning, monitoring and evaluation and health financing in Rwanda's Ministry of Health. This is a position he has held since November, 2012. He's a medical doctor, he's worked as a research assistant, district medical officer, and a director of Kibagabaga District Hospital before he joined Ministry of Health. Special interests are health policy, planning, health financing, private sector engagement, and of course, global health. You're welcome, Deji Pafe. Then I have Dr. Neka Oji, who is the technical assistant for the Minister of State for Health in Nigeria. Neka originally trained as a medical doctor and practiced clinical medicine for a few years before she caught the bug for public health, where she has supervised several projects and traveled to over 25 countries in the world. She is currently a PhD candidate at the Menzies School of Medical Research, University of Tasmania. Neka enjoys hiking, apart from her work in the global health world. And definitely, um, and last but definitely not the least, Dr. Pierre Yameogo, who is the Technical Secretary of Health, Burkina Faso, Medical Doctor, Public Health Specialist, and Technical Secretary in charge of Universal Health Coverage and One Health at the Ministry of Health in Burkina Faso. He supports the effective coordination of interventions, promoting strategic purchasing mechanisms within the country's Ministry of Health. So you're very welcome uh, to all the panelists. And thank you so much for being here. So we will kick up the conversation with Nat. We've talked about this political environment in which conversations on strategic purchasing happen uh, with different stakeholders having different opinions on what to buy, who to buy from and how to pay. So policymakers face a wide range of challenges and choices when they think about the underlying political economy in their different countries. So my question for you, Nat, because you've kind of worked in that intersection of policy and then also understanding the technicalities of the work that needs to be done. How would you describe the political dynamics of strategic purchasing and how can a policymaker be equipped to address this? Nat. Thanks so much, Nkechi. Um, I, I liked, you know, a statement that was made yesterday during the opening session. Um, I think it was by the Kenyan Minister for Health. And he said that to be successful in, you know, um, health system strengthening and moving towards UHC, we must align policy to politics. And that's exactly the point that you've made, Nkechi. How do you do this alignment? Because if you are very you know, high on politics without policy, you are bound to fail. And if it is the opposite, you are bound to fail, fail as well. The one thing that I recognize a lot of policymakers shy away from is to deeply understand politics and to leverage it you know, for policy making. And I think that in the space of strategic purchasing, this is more important for us to focus on because you know, decision making you know, to, to move towards strategic purchasing is fraught with a lot of tensions. Uh, this is because it's essentially about the allocation of scarce health resources, which determines who receives services, where and how, you know, our populations receive those services. Number two, who delivers the services and what are the, I mean, what is the optimal mix of those services and what are the quality requirements for those services? And then after that, how do we pay for those services and how is accountability for outcomes allocated between stakeholders? Now, you would realize that in this space, there is something very critical because strategic purchasing, just like many other policies, is a function of four things. One, 
every stakeholder wants to maximize their benefits and minimize their risks. And so if, for example, you want to expand the benefits package that's available to the population, certainly the population wants a bigger benefits package, uh, but the purchaser probably wants to you know, optimize and minimize their risks in that regard. Uh, then there is the desire to minimize the com complexity of implementation. So in a country like Ghana, for example, most recently, uh, when there was the introduction you know, of um, a mobile platform for uh, people renewing their health insurance uh, uh, you know, membership, it, it caught on and membership has grown by leaps and bounds. Thirdly, every stakeholder wants to simplify how their, their performance is measured. So they want to be measured in a simple a way as possible in a way that doesn't take away a lot of their time and resources, which are already scarce. And number four, above all, is how do they communicate these uh, interests that they have, uh, you know, a, a, around the table in as succinct a way as possible to be understood. Uh, and so I'll go back to my days at Ghana's Health Insurance and recall that when we tried to change uh, one of our you know, provider payment methods to move from DIGs to capitation. Uh, the question became, you know, who is losing and who is gaining and what are the risks that we need to mitigate? And the question was, is capitation too complex? Is it going to affect, you know, the resources and the time of, of the healthcare providers? Uh, then how are we going to measure? And so when I've paid you money uh, upfront for delivery of services to a guaranteed population, how am I able to say, you know, that the services that I want have been, you know, rendered to the quality standards that I want? And fourthly, how have we communicated? So when we started off with capitation, the one thing that we realized was that communication was really very difficult and it remained mostly at the technical level, but it needed to be broken down to the, to the common man's level because the ordinary citizen is the person for whom the services are going to be rendered. And so these are things that, again, should occupy our attention a lot because without these key things, without these uh, you know, uh, key issues occupy our attention, we will not be able to formulate and implement strategic purchasing decisions. And therefore, I would say that our inability to surmount these tensions are one of the things that sort of uh, impede our successful implementation of strategic purchasing reforms in a lot of Africa. Uh, but recently, there has been quite a lot of traction uh, on the continent to move towards this. And some countries have been very bold, uh, have probably mastered the technical issues involved and have made you know, very bold decisions to actually implement strategic purchasing reforms. And I remember in Kenya about three years ago, the cabinet secretary was the minister for health specifically stated that you know, Kenya wanted to move towards strategic purchasing by reforming its health insurer. And in Rwanda, I believe very definitely written in their uh, health financing policy uh, is the fact that they want to move towards strategic purchasing, realizing that you know, resources are scarce and they have to be used efficiently. And so what we want to do is to always try to focus strategic purchasing decisions, one, on the benefits to the ultimate consumer, because that's the person we are working for. And how do we strengthen the capacity of stakeholders to implement policy, set up transparent processes, generate in, you know, evidence to monitor performance, and then overall achieve stronger and sustainable health system that guarantees customer satisfaction. And also making sure that every decision that is taken to reform policy is done at the right time. So in Ghana, when we try to implement capitation, we try to implement capitation, it came around the time of a political election and it wasn't the right time to do so. And so all these little things that we might gloss over are key things that makes us successful uh, in you know, implementation of strategic purchasing policy. And I remember clearly uh, that you know, President Uhuru Kenyatta said yesterday that we must build political will and political commitment for reforms in, in our health systems. And this clearly applies to strategic purchasing. Again, I would say and conclude that we must align policy to politics. 
Thanks, Intech. Thank you so much, Nat. I could sit down here and take notes the whole day. Thank you. There are so many things that you said. Some of the key things for me that are really standing out is the fact that communication is so key to strategic purchasing reforms, um, especially communicating the benefits to the ultimate consumer. But then I really love all of those things you talked about, policy and politics. You talked about, you quoted uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, who said, to be successful in health system strengthening, you need to align policy and politics. You talked about the political will, but then the, also the political commitment. And that ultimately our inability to surmount these obstacles is what really leads to challenges in implementing strategic purchasing um, reforms. Thank you so much, Nat. I will take now, I will now segue from this particular point to a country that appears to be the poster boy for all things great in implementing strategic purchasing reforms. And so this question is for you, Deje Pafe. Rwanda is one of those countries that appears to have the answers to addressing this political economy um, issues. Um, it would appear that you have both the political will and the political commitment. Your country personifies successful reforms in strategic purchasing and other major reforms towards universal health coverage. I mean, we could give examples from your largely successful CBHI, from your, the, the way you were able to align your PBF with your quality accreditation program. The news from Rwanda has always been good. Um, as someone, well, has been good, especially in recent years. As someone who spent about two years in Rwanda, people always ask me, how does Rwanda get things done? And so we have you here today, Deje Pafe, to demystify this for us. And so I ask you, how has Rwanda been able to institutionalize strategic health purchasing, whether it's through curating your policies or anything else? Um, we would love to hear from you. DJ Pafe. Well, thank you so much, uh, Keshi. Thanks, Nat, for the very good uh, uh, insight. Uh, so going straight to the point, as uh, moderator Dr. Keshi has mentioned, uh, the first thing uh, I would say, um, for as you mentioned, for Rwanda, our country, what things are getting done. Number one is what uh, Nas has mentioned. Nas has mentioned a very good point, uh, that's um, the political will. Uh, political will and also uh, a visionary leadership uh, which put people first. Uh, so uh, from that uh, perspective, uh, having a visionary, a visionary leadership uh, we have been we have built our vision uh, around that uh, and have uh, the people at the center of the development. So considering uh, our uh, our development agenda translated in uh, the vision 2050, uh, having Rwanda uh, with uh, an ambition to become a high income country by 2050. So human development of human capital it's number one it's pillar number one so you can understand that uh, the health of the people uh, is a good fast so with uh, that uh, perspective uh, if you have healthy people definitely we will have a productive workforce uh, so that productive workforce as we uh, most of our economy is lay on on the service uh, so the service is about people people being productive good health so we can understand where strategic purchasing fits uh, very well. So um, for the, uh, how we institutionalize strategic purchasing. Number one, uh, we, strategic purchasing is one of our priorities uh, in our strategies going forward, uh, in our development agenda. Uh, how we, we sat together and see how this can be done in, in, making sure that all the policy, legal framework are aligned with that vision of having the strategy purchasing well institutionalized. By institutionalizing strategy purchasing, what we aim at uh, was uh, 
putting uh, uh, the, the, the evidence uh, in all, as you mentioned right even in the beginning, uh, promoting uh, the, the use, your use of evidence in prioritizing uh, um, how to purchase services, to, how the, the type of service that we should purchase with uh, the, the resource that we have. So as the other country in Africa, we all have the same issue about the resource uh, location with a lot of priorities, fiscal space, not accommodating all the priorities. So that's how we use evidence to ensure that what should come first. So by initializing, we, 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 we put or we promote the Polish dialogue. First, bringing all the people together, all the people working on the strategic purchasing or all the people implementing or designing strategic purchasing came on the on board. That's mean the Ministry of Health, the purchasing entities, that's mean health insurance. We have also the representative of the people, the representative of the consumers, but the Ministry of Finance, but also other ministries that are having some services that are being purchased in the health sector one way or another. So we we put together that kind of uh, policy dialogue forum where we discuss all the issues around strategic purchasing, of course, using data. And uh, we have the common uh, understanding, the common um, agreement or what should become first. Number two, we identify something uh, that's very important uh, to see how uh, this can be done. That's mean the, the result, what, what are the expected results if we implement strategic purchasing. The goal or the, uh, the our objective was uh, at least having uh, 2030 achieving the universal health coverage. Just wanted to recall the principle of the universal health coverage uh, that uh, access with uh, to, to, to services with equity, people are gay, accessing quality services, but as well, they are financially protected uh, as they are purchasing services. So that's why strategy purchasing uh, has come on one of the, the priority. That's why also we are, we are institutionalizing. But uh, in brief, uh, what has driven us to the, about putting strategy purchasing is because people came first, what are the type that people are, the service that people are using so that we use data. And then from there, we know what should be purchased, of course, with a common uh, agreement, rather than say things, say that the Ministry of Health, uh, this is the insurance, just take this, just take this, just take this, as a will of the people note, but we put first the evidence, what are the, the I mean, the service that are being, uh, I mean, uh, highly consumed or are highly utilized the services then we go by prioritization as we go um we are, as we grow economically definitely the physical space grows definitely will be accommodating other priority thank you very much uh, Keshi. Uh, thank you thank you so much dj parfait so i there are a couple of things that have come up here for me so one of the key things for rwanda is political will, having the political will. So this really builds on the point that Nat had made earlier, you need to have that in order to be able to move forward. And I believe it was President Uhuru Kenyatta who spoke about that yesterday. So that is very critical. You talked about this visionary leadership that puts people first. You talked about the fact that you are institutionalizing strategic purchasing, not just by talking about it, but by writing it into key policy documents putting it into the agenda that you have for the future. Um, and then you also talked about aligning stakeholders. So different people, different opinions, different thoughts, but aligning everyone behind a common vision of what you want to achieve. That also includes by having policy dialogues. That also includes speaking to the fact that these resources we have are limited. So how do we prioritize what we wanna do now, but getting everyone behind that common vision of strategic purchasing for the future. Thank you so much, DJ Pathy. Again, we would use this last point to really segue to the next um, question that I have. And that's for you, Dr. Pierre Yameogo. So um, I know that one of the key pieces of work happening in Burkina Faso now is really aligning stakeholders behind a common vision of strategic purchasing. Um, but it's interesting because you're also one of those countries that already have recognized the impact 
of strategic purchasing. And so we know that you're spearheading different reforms in this area, um, whether it's the expansion of the benefit package for gratuity and thereby increasing access to reproductive and maternal health services, utilizing the private sector to further increase access to services, which is really innovative because lots of governments don't really know how to tap into the private sector. And then also utilizing your community-based health insurance schemes to be, bring services closer to the people and more recently kicking off this year, very interesting and innovative community health clubs. So my question for you sort of mirrors the question I asked Deje Parfi. How have you been able to lead and to sustain these reforms? Merci bien, Dr. Keshi, for uh, cette question sur l'expérience du Burkina. Et je dois préciser que, euh, avec les prédécesseurs, il faut un engagement politique fort et un engagement économique pour pouvoir effectivement changer la donne au profit des femmes et des enfants qui représentent à peu près 25% de la population. Et 25% de cette population sont ces femmes et ces enfants où on enregistre beaucoup plus de décès. Donc, avec le leadership de son excellence, Monsieur le Président du FASO, depuis six ans, en 2016, ils ont décidé de soutenir, de mettre en place l'accès gratuit aux soins pour ces deux groupes. Et ça fait six ans que j'assure la coordination de la mise en œuvre. Ce qui est important à retenir, c'est que le ministère de la Santé a effectivement mis en place un dispositif dynamique et progressif pour que le paquet de soins soit inclus et au, fur, au fur et à mesure. Par exemple, au début, en 2016, En fonction des ressources disponibles, nous avons pu eh, définir un paquet de soins. Après, nous avons ajouté la gratuité de la planification familiale. Après, nous avons élargi au niveau communautaire et nous sommes en train de réfléchir actuellement pour que d'ici la fin de cette année, nous puissions étendre ça à, aux personnes âgées. Donc, c'est vraiment un engagement fort politique au plus haut niveau et cet engagement est le fruit vraiment aussi de la participation de la société civile qui a su faire un lobbying, un bon plaidoyer pour amener les gouvernants à se pencher sur la question. Et je précise que cette politique qui est en cours, c'est après l'insurrection que le pays a connue en 2014 avec le gouvernement de transition en 2015. Et, et ça montre à quel point, effectivement, le pays est avancé dans le, cette disposition-là. Dans le même temps que nous faisons la gratuité des soins, nous réfléchissons maintenant à un modèle de santé communautaire pour pouvoir agir dans les ménages. Et il faut effectivement <coughs> promouvoir la santé Et un modèle d'achat stratégique qui agit au niveau des communautés a deux intérêts majeurs. Premièrement, ça va éviter d'avoir beaucoup de cas graves de maladies au niveau des hôpitaux. Et en investissant des ressources financières au niveau des ménages, au niveau des communautés, avec les clubs de santé communautaire, nous réussissons à diminuer surtout les factures de la politique de gratuité des soins. Parce que si on soigne au niveau de la communauté, ça devient 10 fois à 15 fois moins cher que si on soigne, par exemple, un enfant au niveau de l'hôpital. Donc, nous venons de lancer cette réforme complémentaire au niveau technique pour que nous ayons ce que nous appelons des ménages modèles, des, des villages modèles, des communes modèles, Et ceci se fera à travers la mise en place de clubs de santé communautaires où ça sera des femmes engagées qui vont pouvoir faire du, des visites à domicile pour pouvoir changer et transformer les ménages. 
Donc, c'est tout un vaste programme qui va s'inscrire et encore peut-être trois ans à cinq ans et nous allons de façon progressive et nous allons y réussir. Voilà pour ce qui concerne la réponse que je peux donner à votre question. Merci. Thank you very much, Dr. Pierre. I think some of the things that really stood out for me is that prioritization is very key for you in Burkina Faso. And this for me is very fascinating uh, from the time when it looked like countries really wanted to provide everything, even though um, it was clear that we don't, no country has unlimited resources, but it appears that prioritization is um, a normal conversation, if I might say, in Burkina Faso. And then you also talked about reflections, always reflecting on the model of healthcare that you have and looking at how best it can serve um, the population. Thank you very much, Dr. Pierre. And then my next question would really um, sort of take a foundation from um, provision of services um, that really speak to the needs, um, whether of the population or of the countries. And so when Spark um, was being scoped for, one of the key concerns that we heard from countries was the fact that they wanted a different type of um, technical assistance. Um, they were really tired of the fly-in, fly-out kind of um, technical assistance. They wanted technical assistance that was responsible, that was responsive, that was provided by experts who had relatable experience and an understanding of the political economy. I think that if there's one thing that we've really unpacked this afternoon is the fact that the political economy is very key to these conversations. So, NECA, you wear two hats in this conversation. One, the hat of policymaker. One of those people who said to Spark, we want to have a regional cadre of experts who would respond to our needs with an understanding of the ecosystem. So that's one hat that you wear. But then you also wear the hat of really being deeply technically involved in providing technical assistance. Um, so I want you to tell us a little bit about um, as a pioneer member of the PAC Community of Health System Strengthening Experts, the FORCE. Um, and the FORCE, by the way, is PAC's initiative to change the face of technical assistance. Establishing this sustainable network of regional and country experts in strategic purchasing to support country engagements. Very different from the fly in, fly out technical assistance that we're all used to. So, Nick, my question to you is Is this community a useful resource for policymakers who are working on strategic purchasing interventions? Is there any lesson that stands out for you on the peer to peer learning? Um, that is available there, and how does this support a policymaker in taking decisions? Nick, are you there? Sorry, I was, I didn't know I was still on mute. Um, so thank you very much, Mukechi, um, for um, that question. Um, and also thank you for all the other panelists for um, also setting the tone of um, this um, discussion. Um, so for the question of if this community is a useful resource um, to health systems across um, the African sub-region, um, I want to say absolutely yes. And um, it can be otherwise. And um, also to say that it's even more gratifying and exciting that it is coming at this time. And then the paradigm that it is you know, projecting, homegrown, home-owned, and people who would have relatable experience to the realities of the time. So it can be otherwise. It is, for me, the best thing that would have happened to the African region, um, especially at this time. We, um, the paradigm of a strategic purchasing is around efficiency. So 
we need to be seen to practice what we preach. And so this community has also set the tone for us to practice what we preach in terms of being efficient and purchasing um, resources, you know, um, for, uh, um, I mean, technical resources for shaping the discussion around strategic head purchasing in an efficient way, instead of using the old strategy of getting technical assistance where people will fly in and fly out. So, um, this community has helped to, you know, shape uh, the discussion, considering the fact that they can relate, you know, with the realities of the time. So this community has been of utmost um, um, help, immense help to shaping the discussion. But I just also would want to say that um, it all work is not yet done. Um, we've not been able to, or the SPAC or the first community has not been able to reach the entire African region. So there still is a lot uh, more work that needs to be done. But just to say that the momentum has been set and it's spreading like wildfire and people are becoming more aware, more interested. And the fact that um, the discussion is becoming, I mean, the strategy for the discussion is becoming more deliberate. The targeting is more deliberate. For me, that is one of the things that stands out in the approach, you know, that um, the community uses. Looking at the right people to engage in this conversation, looking at the right stakeholders, and not just that, looking at how to relate with them and how to target them and, you know, take the discussion to their doorstep for that ownership. For me, that's, uh, it's a pathway to efficiency. For me, that is a pathway to sustainability, which is all, uh, which is what um, um, strategic health purchasing um, is definitely um, all about. So for me, I think, Starting the journey was the first baby step, which we have taken. I think having pushed this momentum or having pushed this paradigm, the new challenge will be, look, we need to spread this paradigm. We need to spread this um, 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 wildfire, which is good. Um, the pair-to-pair -pair learning is also another wonderful approach that, that is very well targeted. So the people who are experiencing these realities are bringing not just their experiences, but that they're also bringing their challenges to the table and they are, uh, free and safe to bring these challenges without fear or favor. And these challenges are co-identified and tailored solutions are identified for solving this problem. For me, that is really the high point of strategic health purchasing. And that is what this entire community is all about. And that is what is really happening. But I must say that um, the momentum has to be sustained. The momentum has to even be further targeted because um, we've been talking about um, health purchasing, financing health, and the politics of it. Because if the budget holders or the political class are not part of the discussion, or the discussion is not shaped in such a way that they are understanding it, they are relating with it, they are contributing to it, and they are taking ownership, then work done. I mean, we haven't done anything, we haven't started working. But the fact that the approach of um, SPAC and the first community is embracing all of this identified issue. For me, um, is, is the best thing that could ever happen to us and we must keep the momentum going. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tameka. So I hear you on the fact that setting up, starting up the force, um, working together with ACS and Health Systems Accelerator, to bring together this group is just a step. Um, and so for you, we now need to be more targeted and also be ensure that there is a representation from across Africa. Because if this group is supposed to support countries uh, with contextual knowledge to 
really be able to um, walk through those strategic purchasing reforms or interventions, then we need to have this spread for Africa. Um, so I hear you, Neka. This is definitely a call to everyone to join the movement uh, as we move um, forward. Now, this uh, coaching approach that Neka talked about, which the force uses, is really um, about people who understand who use soft skills to support country stakeholders to implement reforms. We've talked about the fact that there is so much politics involved in this conversation. And so maybe just to also look at it practically, because Neka, you've given us a great overview of how this group works, how you have your peer-to-peer -peer learning and what you're learning from each other. But maybe to then ask um, practically in country, what does that look like? Um, Dr. Pierre, I'll come back to you um, to ask this question. So one of the key things that we were asked to support in um, Burkina Faso was really to align different stakeholders behind a common vision of strategic purchasing. Um, we knew that this was a very political conversation, very mired, I mean, quite tense. Um, but there is a SPAC coach who is working with your country team side by side, just supporting those conversations. Has that approach been useful in sort of um, tempering down the politics of those conversations on what to buy, how to buy, who to buy from? Has it been useful in taking away um, that focus on schemes or programs and refocusing the strategic purchasing conversation on a functional one, really. Those decisions we need to take about what to buy, who to buy from, and um, how to pay. Uh, Dr. Pierre. Merci bien. C'est vraiment important que, que ce soit les techniciens ou bien les politiques, que nous parlons le même langage quand on parle d'achat stratégique. Et l'illustration de la vidéo, je pense que je vais demander ça après pour pouvoir expliquer en français facile qu'est-ce que l'achat stratégique. Et je me rappelle effectivement, après la réunion que nous avons eue à Cotonou en 2020, en janvier 2020, dès que je suis rentré de retour, et en faisant le point au ministre de la Santé, Et le ministre de la Santé a adressé une correspondance à Spark et pour pouvoir soutenir le, le Burkina dans la construction d'un modèle d'achat stratégique. Effectivement, et nous avons eu la, le retour positif et, et un assistant technique a été désigné, docteur Dossou Jean-Paul du, du Centre de recherche au Bénin. Et nous avons travaillé d'abord en virtuel avec euh, les, le secrétaire général du ministère de la Santé, les directeurs centraux, pour expliciter d'abord le concept d'achat stratégique. Et après cela, et nous avons reçu, j'ai demandé à ce que l'assistant technique même vienne au Burkina, et il a fait un séjour de trois semaines à partir de là et pour que, avec la grille, d'évaluation des pratiques d'achat stratégique. Et moi-même, j'ai appris beaucoup de choses durant ce jour, et son séjour, parce que il a, en utilisant cette grille qui est vraiment et, objective sur la gratuité des soins, sur une échelle de moins 25 où c'est mauvais, à plus 25 où c'est fort, et je me suis rendu compte que la gratuité des soins avait un score de moins 4. Ça veut dire qu'on n'avait même pas zéro. Et Et de façon consensuelle, nous avons établi une feuille de route pour pouvoir identifier les points où c'est négatif, les points où c'est zéro, pour que nous puissions corriger et rendre la gratuité des soins encore plus stratégique. Donc, c'est une expérience qui est en cours. Ce n'est pas encore fini. Et très prochainement, nous allons encore continuer la construction de ce modèle Ce que je retiens de ce mandora, c'est deux choses. C'est que c'est 
pas en fait venir dire comme ça il faut faire, mais c'est du faire faire à partir de la conviction des évidences que les différents acteurs ont sur le terrain. Donc vraiment, à ce niveau, SPAC est très bien apprécié et nous continuons de collaborer pour pouvoir effectivement aboutir à un modèle qui est très, très bien. Deuxième chose que je retiens, c'est que et il faut effectivement s'ouvrir à, à l'extérieur parce que très souvent, on pense que si on, on, on reste sur place, on devrait pouvoir trouver des solutions alors que peut-être la solution se trouve ailleurs. Personnellement, j'ai fait beaucoup de voyages d'études. J'étais tout récemment à Kigali, au Rwanda. Et parfait, et on a beaucoup discuté. Et le Burkina est ouvert surtout pour tout ce qui concerne et le partage d'expérience, ce qui est important pour le ministre de la Santé, c'est de toujours identifier la meilleure approche pour pouvoir y réussir. Vraiment, merci bien à SPAC qui nous a permis et nous continuons toujours la construction de ce modèle. Merci. Thank you so much, Dr. Pierre. I think for me, two key points, which are your last two points, really stand up for me. That And, and it's really buttressing that thing we heard from policymakers from countries at the time that the scoping for SPAC was being done. You don't want anyone to come tell you what to do. No, because in your own countries, you already have experts. You want someone to work side by side with you, somebody who understands your context and then will support you in those reforms that you want to do because you do know Um, what you want to do, even if a person just walks with you to help to actualize that. That's a very important point um, for country engagement, but especially for us at SPAC and how we support countries with the coaching approach. And then the second thing you also talked about is also something that is very important to us, which is cross-country learning, that there is so much that one country can learn from another. I think that during our in-person convening in Burkina Faso um, last year, before COVID shut everybody down, I think there was so much happening, different countries talking to different countries. And that's where actually, like you said, we identified this opportunity. And then we had a coach from our technical consortium in um, Bene go support Burkina Faso. And then, of course, I also met you, Dr. Pierre, while you were in Kigali, having these discussions with Deji Papi. So this is also something that we actively support, Africa learning from Africa. And we can also learn from the global now. But at the end of the day, all of that has to be contextualized for us. So these are two key points um, for me that I'm taking from this. So thank you so much, Dr. Pierre. Dr. Papi, I will come back to you. Um, and sort of build on that first question that I had asked, I had asked um, Dr. Um, Pierre, where I talked about this different view of strategic purchasing. A lot of times when you say strategic purchasing, people say, oh, that's PBF, or maybe that's CBHI. You have a PBF scheme in Rwanda. You also have a successful CBHI scheme in Rwanda. So has maybe looking at strategic purchasing, not as a program or as a scheme, but more in terms of functions, those functions of taking that decision on what to buy, who to buy from, how to pay. Has this approach helped you in being able to um, align stakeholders? And then more importantly, has it helped people to better understand strategic purchasing and how it can be implemented? Over to you, Dr. Uh, Pafi. Thank you very much, uh, Keshi. Um, so as you rightly mentioned, strategic purchasing is a function. So um, I also mentioned before that um, the core uh, business around strategy purchasing, is, uh, what drives strategy purchasing, it's evidence. So evidence has been uh, the motto or the, the triggering factor for a discussion uh, on strategic purchasing. So uh, you, you said uh, or you mentioned something about uh, 
how bring people together. So bring people uh, together, you bring people together with evidence. So data, when you bring data, so everyone, when all everyone understand the data, then uh, you can't, uh, you, you can't uh, go away or uh, reject data because data showed evidence what is there on the on the ground. So, uh, but of course, uh, it's a it's not something just you bring uh, one day and then it's concluded. It's a process. It's a process. That's why Polish dialogue uh, sometimes takes uh, longer. But on our case, uh, we, we build the case. Um, we show the importance of strategic purchasing. Um, we show the people, the data, what's there, what's the idea. I mean, what, what the, the issue around, what the, how to, can we um, uh, solve that issue. Of course, uh, normally in our, uh, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our culture in Rwanda, we are, Problem solving. We have problem solving mindsets uh, because of our history. Uh, we know that uh, solutions should come from us first of all. Of course, we we should look at the other ideas. Of course, uh, those experience from others. But first of all, we shall discuss and find solution among ourselves. So evidence has come uh, or the, uh, evidence has come as uh, the, the driving factor. Um, uh, for a discussion, of course, uh, we bring all the people together. We are not in the same understanding, or in the same understanding. We, but we wanted to build. Uh, of course, you, you go slowly, building capacity with the people, uh, and then you 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 show them how so things should be done, uh, but also uh, discussing other ways of solving issues that we we have. What should we purchase with what we have? Uh, who should be purchased? How uh, these things should be purchased? All those things came on the the table uh, when we, we discussed strategic purchasing. Number two, uh, after discussing among ourselves internally, we we we, we also uh, bring other people. Uh, uh, we all understand the the importance of building partnership, effective partnership. That's why it came up. We, we built a partnership with uh, Spark, with also other institutions, the either in uh, development partner here, also outside, of course, with Spark. So that's where we we, we enlarged the group and we started uh, discuss broadly the, the issue around strategy purchasing. So and then uh, from there, that's Polish dialogue. It's all open up uh, each and everyone. What should be done? Of course, with a clear roadmap, action plan. What should become first? What should be doing? We'll be doing a specific period of time. So uh, those are the things that uh, we, we 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 did. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention: it's all not in, it's not a, it's a journey. Strategic purchasing is a journey. Uh, uh, we we started, but of course uh, we, we should be more flexible, but also uh, adapt new, you know, uh, as new evidence has come in, we should also be able and be flexible to adapt uh, with the current issues we're facing. Of course, let, let, let me just give an example of COVID. Uh, the COVID one. I assume that after COVID, I said we should rethink the way we are purchasing services. Uh, of course, with uh, how different countries, including ours, has, uh, um, has endured this pandemic of, of COVID. So, uh, but the, 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 what should drive us, it's uh, that spirit of uh, 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 frank Polish dialogue, but, uh, but also be accountable one in, uh, to another. If we commit something, we shall make sure that it's done. Uh, for, so with the spirit of, of, uh, um, of um, delivering, bringing the result from what we have been discussing, or what, what, what we are planning. Of course, we can plan and execute, but if it doesn't go well, definitely we should adapt and see what are the way of uh, correcting things. But something must be done to ensure that we are we are making progress. So, in brief, I would say that uh, data or evidence was the with the triggering factor of our, of our discussion. Number two, uh, building effective partnership with other stakeholders, either 
in and also uh, out of the country uh, with what we have, because we all strive to, to learn, getting new idea experience uh, so that we can, uh, we can overcome our challenges. Uh, but another thing that uh, we, we should be more result uh, oriented, uh, with what we have committed should be done in the spirit of accountability. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kish. Thank you so much, Deje Pafe. Starting from the very last point you made, you said strategic health purchasing is a journey. And I love that because it is. There's this beautiful um, slide. I think it was Cheryl, I'm not sure who put that up. And it shows a continuum. It's like a journey from passive to uh, more strategic purchasing. And it shows it's about deliberate decisions made on the basis of information. And so with you just keep going on that journey to more and more and more strategic purchasing. That was just the vision that flashed in my head once you talked about this, Deji Pape. So thank you so much. Indeed, we should capture that somewhere. Strategic purchasing is a journey. You've got to be flexible and you need to adapt as you get new evidence. I also really loved the fact that you focused so much on evidence. Evidence should lead the way. As you get more information, you do better. And then you also talked about bringing different people around the table, whether these are partners, whether these are government folks, just having an effective partnership. You talked about this, you know, you talked about um, those decisions about what to buy, who to buy from, how to pay, but you added um, something very interesting. Um, you added, of course, who should be purchasing. And so for me, that really speaks, and you talked about accountability. And so that speaks to me about the governance arrangements that are needed for strategic help purchasing. And so Nat, I come back to you and I start with that same premise because we do know that good governance is required for effective strategic purchasing. You know, steering purchasers and providers towards health system goals defined by health policy makers. And then of course, making progress towards universal health coverage. Now, these governance arrangements will differ from country to country because everybody takes a different path, whether on their journey to different reforms or to UHC. But my question is, are there some common paths to progress. What would you describe as important governance factors, important maybe indicators that we should be looking at for, for countries to really make progress towards strategic health purchasing? Nat? Thanks so much, uh, I, I mean, what we call governance really is about stewardship and that stewardship for strategic purchasing must be very deliberate. And what I'll do is to probably just characterize this in a cascaded form. You know, as, as nations and as, as countries, we have our various aspirations that are expressed in our constitutions and international commitments. Uh, we translate these into laws, regulations, policies, development plans, fixed out content, ways of ensuring accountability. And when we come to strategic purchasing, really, it just also distills into how we formulate strategic you know, purchasing policies, how do we moderate the interactions between actors and DG Parfait you know, eloquently spoke to that. Uh, and also um, the, the issue of aligning strategic purchasing building blocks. So whilst, for example, you are changing, let's say the um, uh, you know, provider purchasing arrangement, are you also in tandem changing the contracting mechanisms? And are you broadening or, or kind of narrowing the benefits package? So they must all be taken together. Uh, and finally, there must be advocacy. As, as you had, you know, um, in, in terms of Burkina Faso, there was advocacy which actually got the minister interested. Uh, then, you know, the minister moved to ask for support and assistance from, from SPAC. Then, you know, they got to work with, with, with Rwanda on this. Now, all these put together should just lead to three things. One, services must become available to our populations of a good quality, uh, equitable, and also efficiently uh, delivered. 
And there must be a minimization of financial ruin when people seek healthcare, essentially. But what we want to do is to look at those key things that we have to concentrate on. One, a good governance system should be able, or it should allow us to be able to you know, formulate strategic policy frameworks. Number two, we should use that to provide effective oversight of our strategic purchasing systems. And also that allows us to regulate uh, the whole system effectively, ensuring that that regulation brings about the desired results that we are seeking or that we seek uh, for which reason we kind of strengthen our strategic purchasing system. Then again, it, it is going to look at what are the incentives that will make people uh, work uh, towards strategic purchasing and also probably sanctions and systems of accountability. But a, a good system for governing strategic purchasing should have one, a very clear vision. Uh, that vision must be expressed you know, by defining the problem, the problem at stake, uh, the approach to resolving it and what is the sequencing. Then again, we must have effective consultation, participation and consensus building. We must bring legitimate partners around the table with the right capacity uh, and information to discuss the issues at stake. And I do remember, you know, during some of the uh, engagements we had uh, in Ghana, um, some people came to the desk, you know, without the right information, but still they, they you know, had a lot of uh, sway on the system because of their access to, should I say, um, you know, mouthpieces, which were pretty loud. Now, there must be accountability, and accountability is our ability to report on performance, to learn from mistakes, and also to build up on successes, and also check whether we are using resources in the approved manner. We must be transparent, predictable, because predictability means we must apply rules in a consistent manner that follows set schedules. We must be evidence-based. Uh, this has been stressed, you know, a hundred times, you know, on this on, on this uh, uh, you know uh, conversation. Uh, and then we must be, you know, sustainable. But whilst we are talking about sustainability, we also realize that there is the importance of always demonstrating quick wins. So if you're in the policy environment, then you want to segregate what are the quick wins and what are the long-term things that you want to do. And finally, there must be confidence to make decisions and have a quick turnaround. So as you know, those people, the partners involved in governance, do they have the right you know, capacity uh, to take decisions uh, to, to, to further strategic purchasing? Now, on top of all that, as I said in the beginning, everybody has alluded to, we are dealing with people um, you know, who have, um, should I say political power, but people who have political power have one currency and I call that currency political capital. And they, they utilize it sparingly and they utilize it where they are able to demonstrate that they are you know, bringing a lot of good to the society. Uh, and also to show that they are not causing disruptions that undermine the system. And for all of us around the table, when it comes to governance, you know, all stakeholders, the one thing we should understand is that we all possess political power and how we leverage this political power by utilizing the capital we have is extremely important. And so where you don't have good governance systems, there are power games, you know, conflicts remain unresolved, uh, there are unclear priorities or mixed priorities. There's lack of engagement, accountability, and transparency. And also, sometimes the policies are non-aligned. I mean, so because of the non-alignment, you don't have sufficient funding flowing to uh, programs that are considered priority, uh, and they are not sustainable. And also, then you see that you can't uh, enforce regulation. So governance is at the heart. Proper governance is at the heart of you know putting in place and implementing strategic purchasing policies in our countries. Over. Thank you so much, Nat. Governance is at the heart of implementing strategic purchasing policies. And some of the things that you talked about that could really lead us towards effective governance are having a clear vision, effective participation, the right people should be around the table, accountability, transparency, and predictability. You talked about the fact that there has to be an evidence base. I believe that a lot has been said about that today, DJ Papi specifically. 
Um, there also has to be a plan for sustainability. Um, and then we should also, while working through this whole process of how to bring change about, we should be able to demonstrate big wins. And then there should be that confidence to make decisions just to move things around very quickly. So thank you so much, um, Nat. I mean, I could go on with this session, um, but we do have participants who have already a lot of questions queued and waiting for different participants. So I'm going to take, uh, for the panelists, I'm going to take um, a first round of questions and then we'll come back for more. So let me start from um, this. This question says, um, do you consider as a low hanging fruit for Spark, the idea of influencing purchasing arrangements at national and sub-national health insurance authorities to adopt strategic approaches? Okay, I hope I understand this question. And then goes further to say, it appears that a buy-in by health insurance authorities will most likely influence budget processes at ministries of health. That's a very interesting question. And uh, maybe Nat and um, Dr. Pierre, you might want to um, perhaps respond to these ones, um, to this. Um, then I also have this other question that says, interesting experience in Rwanda. For countries that do not necessarily feel or perhaps have the strong political will for strategic purchasing, how can they build it? It's almost like, what can we learn from you, Rwanda? How can the coaching approach suggested by SPAC contribute to putting strategic purchasing among the priorities um, of governments? Neka, I'll, I'll leave that second part of the question um, to you. And then the first part uh, to you, uh, Dr. Parfi. Uh, the one that says for countries that do not have the strong political will for strategic purchasing, how can they build it? Um, teach us something. And then there's also this very interesting question here that says, what evidence informs strategic purchasing? I think I would love perhaps um, all the panelists um, to weigh in on this as you're answering the other questions. What evidence in your own experience, in your own countries, uh, really um, speaks to strategic purchasing. And maybe the final question, so that we can take this round before we come back for more, if we have, one, uh, if we have more time. Um, one of the key aspects that Rwanda mentioned is having an evidence-based approach. But having such an approach requires reliable data. And many African countries face numerous challenges in terms of quality of information. What is the experience of Rwanda in addressing capacity gaps in data governance and information systems for health. Clearly, that is for you, DJ Parfait, but would also love to have any other panelists weighing on that. So let's start. Um, Nat, do you want to go first? Sure, Nketi, thanks so much. Um, and thanks for the question, and uh, thanks to the questioner. And certainly, I mean, wh when you talk about strategic purchasing, the, the, the players are four key players. You're talking about, you know, uh, government, you're talking about the purchaser, you're talking about the consumer, uh, and then you're talking about the healthcare provider. So um, whatever happens has uh, effects, ripple effects throughout the system. And, you know, in regards to what are the low hanging fruits, I do understand your question to mean, can we do reforms at the health insurance agencies themselves? Uh, yes, it is one of the key things that you can do. Those things, you know, over which those health insurance agencies have control uh, should be those things that I call the low hanging fruits that they can deal with. And those have to do with efficiencies within their own system. Uh, and also actually changing uh, the complexities that sometimes they impose, which are unnecessary uh, in order to bring about efficiency. And so in that regard, yes. In the broader scheme of things, if, for example, it's about changing a payment method, uh, you need to involve everybody. Uh, and that involvement should actually be driven by the stakeholders at large, because then you have to have buy-in and support for those changes. Uh, and as we have all discussed, the way to go ahead is to put the, uh, the consumer at the center, but also to bring up the issues of sustainability 
the issues of quality as well as the issues of you know um, getting um, uh, should I say uh, more uh, transparency and 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 uh, you know uh, responsibility into the system uh, to to come to the fore. I think that's what you have to do. But yes, there are things that can be done by health insurance agencies, uh, you know, to address those low hanging fruits. But finally, let me say that when it comes to purchasing, certainly it's it's different in every country. So you don't necessarily talk about health insurance everywhere because some countries don't have them, but still they are engaging with strategic purchasing. Thanks, Nkechi. Okay. Thanks, Nas. Dr. Pierre, do you want to go next? Uh, oui. Merci bien pour uh, les questions et, et observations. Et je, je, je voudrais pas uh, répéter ce qui a été dit seulement. Seulement, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que c'est quelque chose qui est progressif et qu'il n'y a, a pas une disposition qui est figée et que le, le Burkina est dans la dynamique de toujours changer pour atteindre vraiment le niveau optimal. Ce, qui est, ce, qui, ce que je voulais ajouter pour la, la partie concernant le rôle des acteurs, il faut une séparation des séparation des fonctions. La société civile, les organisations de la société civile doivent vraiment occuper une place importante dans la redévabilité, la transparence. Et c'est ça qui, qui, qui nous permet vraiment d'avoir un système solide et qui nous permet d'aller en développement. Et le financement aussi doit être vraiment des ressources qui sont internes. Si on, si, on, si, on, si on utilise des ressources externes pour construire un modèle, on est sûr qu'on ne va pas y arriver. Donc, le Burkina a choisi d'utiliser des ressources internes et d'ajouter au fur et à mesure les, les, différents, les, les différents services. Et actuellement, la vision même, c'est d'aller jusqu'au niveau des communautés pour pouvoir réduire vraiment les coûts de facture. Donc, Nous sommes dans le processus et au fur et à mesure, nous corrigeons et nous, nous, nous continuons. Merci bien. Thank you so okay, much, Dr. Think... Pierre. Um, DJ Pape. Thank you very much. Uh... I think I'll go next before DJ Pape. Oh, that's fine, Emeka. Yes, so um, the question I want to tackle is, somebody asked, said, how can the coaching approach suggested by SPAC contribute to putting strategic, um, I want to believe this is strategic purchasing and not procurement, among the priorities of government? So um, over time, we've been able to identify the fact that, look, um, the coaching and mentoring approach used by SPAC is usually, it's deliberate, um, it's targeted. Um, so th those are the principles around their um, strategies. And so sitting with the country stakeholders, you know, to um, provide that guidance for you to identify where your problem lies, because in walking you through that, not telling you your problem. So they work with you to identify your problem such that you're able to take ownership of that problem. Because if you understand your problem, then you'll be able to, you know, identify the challenge, uh, the, the, the solutions to the problem. And of course, also because of the fact that you're more conversant with the contextual issues, you're also able to identify the challenges and how those challenges can um, be tackled. So the SPAC community is equipped with providing that guidance, you know, to work with you and walk you through your problem to identify and take ownership of that problem. And of course, also 
um, demonstrating regional and close country examples and strategies that had worked, perhaps that can also help to spark that interest, you know, uh, that will make the country key stakeholders to make that decision of um, putting strategic purchasing as one of government um, priorities. This has worked in all of the countries that um, SPAC has um, provided um, support for, and um, it will be different in your country. And um, again, like I said, understanding the contextual issue for us to also provide the contextual guidance for you to identify and solve your problem. So that is the approach that SPAC is using and will use to um, support your country in getting strategic purchasing into um, as one of the government's priorities. Thank you. Neka, do you also want to weigh in on evidence? Um, because we talked a lot about evidence, evidence needed for strategic purchasing. There's a question there, and I had posed it to all um, panelists. Do you want to speak to that before Deji Papi now uh, takes it? Nick, I think you're muted. I, I can't hear you. Sorry, I didn't know that. Okay. Sorry, please. So in, in terms of synthesizing evidence, like I said, the pair-to-pair -pair learning um, strategy is also one of um, um, the means by which we have used to galvanize evidence from the region. Um, yes, we have technical people, but we also have people who can relate to what um, happened um, in countries to source and curate this evidence, which we now put together, you know, and um, and share it widely. Um, so uh, most recently, uh, it was around um, curating the evidence on how countries strategically purchase or did not strategically purchase um, services or essential services during the high point of um, the pandemic. And not just that, also identifying with the challenges that they encountered and how these challenges you know, were tackled. These are pathways through which we curate the evidence that countries can relate and countries can take ownership. And not just that, these learnings you know, are put in such a way that countries can learn from them. Countries can choose to replicate these learnings based on established and scientific evidence that has been put together. So those are some of the strategies that um, SPAC is also using to push the paradigm of strategic health purchasing. So also providing that evidence, that the, the examples that look, this is evidence-based, it has worked in this and that country, it has worked in this and that context, um, and of course highlighting, it's not all um, rosy, um, countries encounter challenges. Um, we don't sweep that under the capital, rather we um, use evidence to highlight these challenges and provide um, guidance on how these challenges could be um, tackled as well. Over. Thank you very much, Neka. That was that was very insightful. Um, over to you now, um, Deji Pape. Thank you very much, uh, Keshi. Uh, and thank you very much for one of the people in the audience for the question uh, on how um, um, uh, we can, I mean, just bring the more awareness about strategy purchasing. Let me use that term. So he may, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the person mentioned, rightly mentioned about, I mean, mentioned about the country that's where there is no political will. What thing, what the, 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 the thing that can, advise him or her. So number one, it's, uh, it's first gets all the people who are, in, who are involved one, in, one way or another in strategic purchasing, understanding the importance of strategic purchasing to achieve the universal health coverage. Uh, I assume that most of the country, all countries have committed to achieve the universal health coverage. Um, so, so this purchasing should be seen in the perspective of uh, achieving uh, universal coverage uh, rather than 
bring in some like a one uh, standalone uh, initiative, but it should be uh, uh, well uh, translated or well uh, subscribed in the invest investors coverage uh, uh, concept or framework. So from there, everyone on the uh, who, are, who is involved in one and another in that strategic purchase, either in the design implementation or monitoring of, the, of that initiative should be understanding the, the importance of uh, implementing strategic purchasing. So from there, you just build that kind of consensus. Um, uh, that's consensus people understand. Then there should be some kind of progressively engaging decision makers. So engaging decision makers, there is two ways. Number one, you have to do more advocacy. Advocacy, that's mean you should make sure that you have built your case why should strategic purchasing uh, being be designed or implemented in your country in the perspective of investor coverage achieving investor coverage then if decision makers understand definitely they are the one to put, to take it further to a other level then you build that uh, um, uh, what the so-called uh, political will so uh, I will encourage uh, uh, people, uh, even if you don't see changes, uh, but as I rightly mentioned, it's a journey. It's uh, you go slowly and progressively. Don't uh, take courage and then uh, don't be discouraged uh, and um, and uh, quit the the. I mean, um, uh, I mean that that's I mean uh, that's journey. So because we are all called to, to be a change agent. Uh, so the change uh, in the world are started with few people and then you spread the, the initiative and it goes all the way. But what matters is you have to build uh, properly uh, your case and people understand the importance of implementing purchasing. What are we losing if you don't purchase strategically? What are we uh, gaining if you're not doing that? So there should be that kind of uh, understanding. Of course, as I already mentioned, evidence. Uh, it won't be uh, all should be built on the on the on the evidence. Either you build a business case, either you build a, what's called depend, depending on terminology as people use investment case, business case, advocacy paper. Uh, de depending on the name or terminology people can use, but definitely something. Uh, should be done and uh, you build a kind of uh, consensus up to the decision makers where uh, big decisions are being made. And definitely strategic purchasing, hopefully it should be one on the day will be on the menu or on the, or the table or to, for discussion. So if you allow moderator, I'll jump on the second question, um, the issue of, uh, of um, in a, how, how to address the capacity gap and data governance and information systems. So I would say that uh, uh, some few uh, uh, points here, uh, I'll talk about a few points. Number one is about uh, uh, identifying the data gap or capacity gap, uh, the data that we governance, uh, data governance, all the way from uh, or the health system. Of course, uh, uh, priority should be should be, or the focus should be on the people who are generating or the people are working on the on those data on daily basis. Uh, if you understand why are they collecting those data and understand the importance of the use of those data, definitely they'll be collecting those data with a clear uh, vision or perspective, uh, know what should be coming out from those, uh, uh, the, those data that they are collecting, they are collecting or they are they are, in, they are entering in the system, identifying as well the gaps that are the term of data uh, gap, gaps in terms of data, then see how uh, they can address them uh, with the available resources that they, they have, but also they can also they are, they, are, they can also build. I mean, they can also bring other stakeholders on board. The people can help them to 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 build those systems. Of course, it should be country-led, uh, uh, not like not uh, partner-led or donor-led. It should be country-led, so that 
uh, it will become more sustainable uh, in the future. Um, the other thing that uh, oh, oh, um, it's built for the governance, the data governance and the information system, uh, uh, there should be a regular uh, discussion around data to, uh, to ensure that the people are using data, those who are collecting data, the people who are generating those data, but also the people who are making those data being available, uh, putting all the people uh, in the discussion, the, what has come from the data that they have provided, and then the, uh, how the data have been used and uh, what is the type of decision that they are, the data has been uh, used for. Then they should be motivated around that. And then there should be a kind of uh, um, mechanism or a results-based uh, approach to ensure data that is, uh, is being generated is, uh, is reliable, it's uh, coming on time, uh, it's coming timely but as well uh, is accurate. Of course, the, there is uh, an element of data quality that comes in. So with the data quality, uh, different perspective, uh, you either you use the different methodology that we have um, uh, in country, but also other methodology you may need to, to adopt to ensure that uh, data are available on time and they are also accurate. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, moderator. Thank you so much, DJ Parfait. Uh, I also want to use this opportunity to thank all the other wonderful panelists, Nat, Neka, Dr. Pierre. We can have this conversation forever. Unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. So I'm going to hand this back to Dari, noting that I know we have a lot more questions. We're going to curate them. We're going to answer them and we're going to put them up on our website. So please be sure to visit spap.africa. All of those questions and answers will be there. 